Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week, I'm joined by the big man, Connor Dunn. And coming up this week, we have some of the fastest bikes from the World Championships, an affordable gravel group set, the bike fault, and comments of the week. And for our main talking point this week, we are discussing if expensive and high-tech bikes are ruining the world of bike racing. Is tech ruining cycling? So this week's main talking point really is a follow-on from last week where Hank and I were discussing if carbon fibre has like revolutionised the cycle industry, which I think is a good thing. However, lots of people in the comments were actually quite against it. You see there were people saying carbon fibre and all this crazy tech innovation is actually taking away aspects from the bike racing and making it more about the bikes rather than the athletes, which is an interesting debate to have, hence why we're saying now. Yeah, and the world champs at the moment are highlighting this, especially if you look in the track events where many brands are releasing their kind of bikes that nations are going to be using for the Olympics. You're seeing some real fast stuff out oh. there at the moment, and races are getting decided by a hundredth, a thousandth of a second. So this tech is definitely impacting the results. A hundred percent. So I've been watching a lot of the world championships, say, the sprint events and the track cycling, where the winning margins, as you've said, are that small, and you've got People may be in the top spots, taking taking like the medals, where they've got all of the innovation, all of the equipment. They move further down the results, and you've got some nations which have got a less refined equipment setup, should we say. We've got people that aren't even using aero helmets, people that aren't using skin suits, and they're using bikes and equipment, which I would say is very much like mid-tier kind of stuff, really accessible, which is great, but the thing that kind of does occur to me is that People further down the results sheet with lesser equipment, if you gave them equal stuff, would they be at the top? Yeah, but does that matter? Because we're talking about the world championships here, yeah. the pinnacle of the sport. Yeah. And cycling, I mean, you don't you don't do it without the bike. The bike <laughs> That's is, true, you the can't, bike, yeah. The bike is part of it. It's like a or, fundamental of cycling. Yeah, and it always has been. And yeah. if you're not pushing the bike forward, you're not pushing yourself forward either. So yeah. it is all about how fast, how far you can travel on two wheels and developing that bike within the current rules, because there yeah. are standards out there, you can't go willy-nilly. It's, he it's like them. heavily regulated, actually, yeah, it's, it? it's pretty heavily regulated, so... Well, I, I think... Yeah, go on, no, sorry. No, I was just going to say, personally, I think that innovation needs to be there, and that tech needs to be there to kind of push the sport forward. That's kind of where the wonder is, it's seeing these athletes do these incredible speeds, and just pushing the boundaries... Bit and, like, the bit equipment easier. to help them get there. Yeah, and at the top step, I think some riders may suffer from that, because they yeah. don't have the funding or the money to be able to keep up. Yeah. But that's kind of part of the game. Yeah, 100% I'm with you in some aspects of that. I don't ever want to see the entire industry of cycling, well, certain racing, everyone having to use the same bike. But I think there are examples where I do want to see things equalised out a little bit more. Like maybe uh, nations that don't have the resource have the ability, the ability and access to that top level stuff. Yeah, and I also think if we're looking at kind of developing riders, juniors, yeah. um, amateurs, and it's kind of thinking the under 23 ranks, yeah. I think there should be some sort of more strict rule where you have to race more standard equipment. You know, you can't. Like have... in the build up, as like riders are progressing through their career, yeah. you think? Because there's such a short space where those sort of riders can show themselves. And I think it's unfair to have someone who puts in the work, retams it, doesn't have the money to get a yeah. top spec bike, doesn't quite get noticed compared to someone who does have the money, real crazy bike, yeah. gets those results, gets on a pro team, da da da. Well, I, that's a really good point, but on the subject of saying about equal equipment and regulating this stuff, in the men's individual um, pursuit final, 4,000 meters, we had Dan Bigham versus Filippo Ganna. Yeah, so Dan Bigham is like the Ineos tech guru. So he spends a lot of his time helping the riders get the best equipment and the fastest setups. Whereas now in the World Championships, you've got Dan Bigham now racing against the person that he spent all his time getting as fast as possible. And in this situation, you've got two riders on as near as damn it, I'm going to say, identical setups. They've got the same frame, the same wheels, the same tyres, the same, no doubt, the same research has gone into their body position, the same helmets. The only difference that I could see from like the initial pictures I'd look was there's a different skin suit they've used because of different nations have different kit supplies and the handlebar extensions are slightly different. And that, as far as I can see, is the difference between it. 
I did have a real big urge there to pretend to be Yoda and say the master becomes the apprentice. You could have said that. <laughs> so, but it's true though, isn't it? So, I mean, yeah, they've got the same stuff. The difference between them in the final, 0.054 seconds. Over four kilometers. That is nuts. That's and crazy. That is the difference between what I think is one athlete's performance against another, almost irrespective of the equipment. But that's a cool thing. I, I quite like that. But that is a cool thing. But that's what we're half saying is like, if everyone had access to the same bike, take the men's four kilometer individual pursuit. So if everyone in that competition had the same setup as Dan and Filippo Ganna, do you start to think we would maybe see riders who finished, say, maybe outside of the top 10, trouble him for medals? I still don't think we would, because I think the knowledge Dan Bigham has of aerodynamics and making that setup work for him yeah. is superior from from. But the that's time part of like, the money and the resource aspect. <laughs> Yeah, and the time and the thought process too. Yeah. So it's not. I don't think it's just the money in Dan Bigham's case. No. To be fair to him. But I do think it. I I do genuinely think it would impact the results. I don't think it would be as drastic as like flipping them around as such. But I think you might start to see some riders trouble in the top step. I just don't think it would be as exciting. Yeah. Because when you have Dan Bigham going up against Filippo Garner, it's like yeah. it's like a boxing heavyweight match. And yeah, it's not like. Who's got the upper hand? Yeah, um, and then it's you know best best rider wins. All right. So you'd kind of lose an aspect of that if it was standardised equipment. Well, but do. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't it's know either. Opinion. But this is part of the fun of debating it. Everyone at home should let us know in the comments section down below what are your thoughts on the subject. I'm kind of in a halfway house. I want to see tech innovation, and perhaps in some certain events, I want to see it really like standardised. Perhaps everyone forced to use the same bike. Yeah. I like the innovation, which is surprising yeah. for me because yeah. I'm a bit of a traditionalist. I thought you were going to be like, no, everyone on a steel bike. Yeah. I, I, to be honest, I thought that was what the way I was going to oh. react when I started. You just chucked us a curveball. Yeah, there. and actually, I'm a, I'm a closet tech nerd. Well, there you um, go. So there you go. I like the innovation. I like seeing that bat, and I like it. the fact that it's brains and brawn. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, yeah, as I say, let us know in the comments section down below, and um, maybe we'll discuss it next week. It's now time for Hot and Spicy Tech, and kicking things off this week, we have a new affordable group set from MicroShift, and it's called Sword. So, is MicroShift is a brand known for their budget group sets, and this is their first gravel-specific one. I've got some of the stats here for you. Okay, it's 10-speed, it comes in a 1x or 2 by options. You've got wide-range cassettes, so if you use the 1x setup, you've got 11 to 48 tooth option. 2x, two you can, can go 11 to 38. You've got a clutch rear derailleur, which can be switched on and off. And it's kind of got all of the hallmarks of what we're seeing in lots of the other gravel group sets. There's even an option that if you go one by, you can have a left-hand lever which activates drop post. That's pretty cool. Bear in mind though, this isn't the full group set, so calipers, rotors, chain, and bottom bracket aren't included in yeah. this, but at a price point of around 400 pounds sterling or 500 US dollars, it is a good option out there, pretty affordable, and if yeah. it's durable as well, this could be something good. Yeah. Now, one point to note is helping to keep that price low is also the fact that it's using cable disc brakes, not hydraulic ones. But I don't think that's a deal breaker. And as you say, it's great to see an affordable option out there for people that perhaps don't want to spend a fortune on their um, gravel bike setups. Yeah, nice. I like it. Next up, we've got a new track bike from Look, and this crazy looking thing is called the P24, which we think replaces the T20 from the Tokyo Olympics. P24, because it's going to be represented at the Paris Olympics in 2024. The last one was in Tokyo T um, in 2020, hence makes the 20. Lot, makes a lot of sense. It does make a lot of sense. Like I thought they just drew it out of a hat. <laughs> now, official details on this bike are pretty thin on the ground, but from some of the images that we've seen, you can see you've got super wide um, like fork legs, similar in design to what's used on the Hope Lotus bike. However, the split design doesn't continue all the way up to the handlebars. It sort of tapers in at the headset. You've also got a really exaggerated um, super wide seat stays, but this time the seat stays extend all the way up to, to the saddle as such. You've got like two seat posts that come up and then join at the top. Now I think the idea behind this is that instead of having one seat post in the middle, which is then directly having the wind hit it, you've now got two which are tucked in the wake of the airflow, which is already disturbed from the rider's legs. Makes sense. Presumably to try and make the bike faster. But what it does do is make for a pretty interesting looking bike. 
imagine imagine how crazy it'd look if I was riding it in my size. <laughs> just, so much. It'd literally be like a plane. <laughs> I'd take off. Where's Connor? Oh, he's just doing a flying lap. Oh, he's just <laughs> out of the way of the velodrome. Oh, cool looking thing though. I like it. it. Like it a lot. Um, next up, actually, in Hot Tech, we've got another super fancy track bike. This time, it's from Canyon. And this is the same release. It's been used at the World Championships um, in preparations ahead of the Paris Olympics. Here's what it looks like. Canyon say this is their fastest and most aerodynamic bike to date, and they also say it's a combination of 155 hours of track testing. What? 312 wind tunnel tests, which, no, that's not a typo. That is actually <laughs> how many tests they did on this. And 442 supercomputer tests, so that is a heck of a lot of work. It's absolutely wild. So I think it's developed alongside aerodynamic expert Swiss side, and this bike has kind of gone down a different design philosophy to a lot of the other track bikes. So they've made it a lot narrower, whereas other brands have gone down the route of making bikes super, super wide. Now, um, Canyon have also developed, alongside this bike, their own disc wheels to be used with it, which is interesting to see. And in theory, by doing that, it means they can make a complete system which works together. They're also, this bike is shipped with tubeless tires, which I gotta be honest, if you go back a few years, I think you'd be, someone would say you're crazy if people were going to be using tubeless tires on the track. It was like tubular all the way there. Um, now the Speedmax CFR track is available to order from Canyon. It's a bit of an eye-watering price. Yeah, you ready for it? Brace for impact, £18,999 or €20,000. And US dollar pricing is um, well, it's still to be confirmed. Yeah, Canyon's most expensive bike to date. Well, we were right there, weren't we? Yeah. <laughs> And then finally in Hot Tech this week, I just want to briefly mention the Matthew Vanderpol crash at the World Champs where he slid out and snapped the boa dial off his shoe and, spoiler alert, carried on to then win the race. Yeah, it was insane. I mean, <laughs> mad respect. I also spotted this on VeloKick's Instagram. They got a pair, a photo of the shoes and he actually broke his cleat as well, just nipped the bottom off what? the Shimano cleat. So, I mean, when you look at that photo... That's He's insane. so lucky because if that had been any further, the cleat was gone. I don't know what he'd have done. I'm um, amazed how his foot just didn't pull out of the pedal when he's like smashing up some of those climbs. Yeah, I mean, it must have affected him, but I mean, he still pulled the gap out. Yeah, fair <laughs> a minute and a half since that crash. And actually, having spoken throughout this show about high tech equipment and whether we need it and stuff like that, I guess there's a simple solution here. If he'd have been using lace up shoes, no Burdale to rip off. Which leads me nicely to mention about our DMT competition that we have running because you can be in with a chance of winning a set of lace-up DMT KRSLs. So if you want to um, find out about that, click on the link in the description yeah, down yeah. below. Nice one. And apparently that boa dial was located and has become a collector's item. <laughs> really? <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> what? I can't believe someone found Bit that. Bit of sports history. There you go. All right. Um, more hot tech next week. Right then, it's comments of the week. Comment of the week. Comment of the week. I told you not to do a rap. I don't know, uh, yeah, but you told me not to, and then I just thought, oh, yeah, I have to do it. Right, first up, um, <laughs> from last week's tech show, uh, Kita Kimura 719 says, talking about innovation, I want, I want much more of them around rider safety. I don't understand why we don't have spine protectors for roadies, Dyneema made jerseys to reduce road rash, and so on and so on. Good point, I think. Yeah, good point. Uh, definitely on the road rash. Yeah. I think I think spine protectors might be a bit over the top. It does but, seem over the top. Um, what was the other comment yeah. we had? So this was from Drew Dad Dirt's bag. Uh, <laughs> I love the Madonna's isoflow is now called the A-hole. Yeah, well, I just decided it was the aero hole, so just shorten it down. Makes sense to me. Um, underneath the Superlight bike, which was Oleg's bike from Twisted Wheels, this was an incredible road bike, actually, if you haven't seen it. Uh, Lars RR says, usually these builds are pretty uninspiring amalgamation of expensive components that everyone with enough money can copy. This, however, with internal cable conversion, custom paint job, and the custom wheels really is something special. Hats off, amazing build. Yeah, and Guido Spaniel 8896, awesome bike. I would have used shorter valve stems, though. Simple to the point, Simple, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then on Sunday, I had a bike fit video that was out. Mark Howard 1573 says, the integrated cockpit is an interesting subject when I wanted to go narrow with my handlebars. I wanted 38 centimetres. It was almost impossible to find one with the correct stem length I needed. I guess the assumption from manufacturers is that if you want a narrow handlebar, you probably have short torso and arms. In the end, they switched to a standard bar and stem combo, much cheaper, and could get the fit they needed. That is actually one of the issues with a combined bar and stem system. 
you're either restricted by what the manufacturer makes, or the manufacturer's got to make tons of different options. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Matt Coates also commented, this is the best guy I've ever watched and super helpful. Thank you guys, there you go. Too kind. I picked that one out myself. I thought you did. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's now time for the bike vault, Connor. This is my favourite part of the show. Yeah, I and I hope you enjoy it a little bit yeah, as well. Like Am I ringing the bell? You can ring the bell. Yeah. Okay. So we um, judge people's bikes to be either nice or super nice. If they're super nice, we ring the bell. You can play along um, by uploading pictures of your bike in the GCN app. Nice. So first up this week is the most super nice bike in the app last week. Um, what is it? It's a Canyon Air Road. Yeah. What do you make of this? Are we going to agree or are we going to just vote it nice? No, I mean, you can't, you can't escape that's a super nice. There's nothing. Nothing to be said. It's a beautiful bike. I love. I do love the new Ortegra. Yeah. I do like that kind of slightly. I don't know. It's not like polished. It's like a kind of matte black, isn't it? I would perhaps call it satin. Brushed. I'm not sure. Either way, I like it. <laughs> do, you, do you want to ring the bell? Yeah, I'll ring the bell. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Right. First up this week, we have got T Kui H4 with a Pinarello Dogma F from 2023, why is the bike presented the wrong way around? Yeah, well, that can't be a super nice. It's Impossible. A, yeah. I mean, it is a nice Stars, bike, but there's no way that could be a super nice. I do apologise. Valves up and down, 6 and 12 o'clock, spotted that one. Yeah, heartbreak. Um, yeah, cranks aren't, aren't level. Nice swimming pool, though. Nice, endless. nice very nice swimming pool. Yeah, yeah, um, slightly worried about swimming pool, though. I mean, if this was one of us taking this photo, that bike would have to be at high risk. There's a good chance that I fall in. Yeah. Okay. I'm taking no chances there. Right, just a nice for us there. Next up, who have we got? We have got... <laughs> right there, mate. 1531212. Sorry, no. Also known as arrow, arrow underscore Y. y. <laughs> <laughs> arrow Y14 is my dream bike build and I love it. What is it? Oh, it's an Eddie Merckx. Eddie Sam Merckx. Mimo. Yeah, looking nice. Are those oh, I like this. Are those oval chain rings? Slightly yes. Oh yeah. Able chain rings. They are able chain rings. Anyway, what do you think of the bike? I like it. I think that's super nice. I'd give it super nice. Whack it in. Well, I mean, feel free. The bell's in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Next one. This next is one. From Matt's local, otherwise known as two one eight one one nine. Of course, it's a Derosa uh, eight three eight from the year twenty twenty two. I love really the colourway. Like I like this. This is definitely a super nice for me. Um, I haven't even gone into details about why it not, might not be. But yeah, don't just, worry about my thoughts on it. That's fine. Yeah, no, I like the lines. I like how it's just that traditional look, road bike, modern group set, everything about it. Blooming amazing. Complete agreement with you. Yeah. I'm going to jingle, jingle the bell a little bit. Um, next in is Martin's first ST1. Uh, with a Cervelo S3 from the year 2019. Nice colours. This has got your uh, old Tegra on that you, you said you quite like. Looks like a very familiar road. Does it? Looks very familiar. I'm trying to place it. I mean, if it was very familiar, you wouldn't have trouble placing it. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's very true. That is true. I do like this though. Um, right, Valves I, are aligned, it's in the correct gear. Cranks are almost aligned. There's no unnecessary accessories. Bottle cages link up with the colourway of the frame. Yeah. The saddle is pointing down slightly, which you like. Yeah, I like. Pikachu does it. Yeah. We have got a video coming out very soon on saddle angle, where I've delved into it a bit more. Okay. Well, depth and why we might be able to change preconceptions about our saddle angles. But anyway, more on that. Right, on to the last uh, bite of this week's bite vault. It's from Gregor underscore Geisman with a Cube Pro Race. What do you think? Oh, goodness me. What a yeah, I don't know where to start. Horrific. I mean, I'm sure it's a lovely bike, but we Have they can't, crashed? We can't see it all. How Maybe they know? crashed and Maybe. took a picture. Yeah, they could um, be taking a picture of the waterfall, for all I know. Mm. Or is that a slide next to the waterfall? Yeah, sorry, this car it's, it's just a nice. It's just a nice. It's just a nice, but I hope you had a lovely ride. Yeah. Um, well, it feels a bit of a shame to end on on that in the bike vault, but never mind. We've had a great time in the yeah. show this week. Loved I've picture. loved having you here. Thanks, thanks very much thanks, for joining mate. us. Always a pleasure. Right, um, we're going to go now, shall we? Let's do it. See you next time. Bye.